So one of the things that was talked about at the Blender conference is the new feature coming soon called Blender Apps. In this video, we're going to talk a little bit about that and try to figure out if it's something we might actually find useful. Let's go ahead and just jump into it. So Blender Apps is one of the new features that Tom discussed in his keynote at the Blender conference a couple weeks ago now. And so the way they're defining these is they're defining these as experiences powered by Blender. Basically what that means is it gives you the ability to create your own kind of custom version of Blender that does only what you want and nothing more. And so one of the examples that they, show, they showed is this kind of like stripped down viewer app. Basically what it is is it's an app version of Blender where um, you're basically limited to being able to drag these different models in here. You can orbit around and then you can apply different textures or materials to it. It's basically a version of Blender that's designed to just be a viewer, which could be especially valuable if you're dealing with people that aren't necessarily great with 3D or anything like this. You could use this to build interesting like product configurator type things. Or um, the example that really works for me is architecture, right? Because that's kind of that's kind of where I come from is the architecture and construction standpoint, being able to create a design and then create Create something that allows you to share it with the people that you're actually doing the design for that maybe aren't as technologically sophisticated and allowing you to be able to like make these changes and things like that could be especially powerful. And so there is definitely precedent for this in other softwares and in the architecture um, and interior design spaces. So Twin Motion, for example, has their cloud version where you can export your models into kind of like an online viewer or a standalone desktop version for people that don't own Twin Motion where they can fly around different models. So I could definitely see this being very useful if you do architecture and interior design type things with Blender. So basically the way that this would work is they would provide like an overall app template and then they would provide templates for the different functionalities that you could kind of bring into the code, allowing you to add and remove different parts of the functionality of Blender until you get what you want. Now, one question I have about that is how much actual code editing would be required as opposed to like dragging and dropping different code in here, because I think that's going to massively affect the number of people that can actually use the tool. And so really, they're talking about two fundamental ways of being able to run this. So either you would have like a blend X file that could reference the blender that's already installed on your computer, right? So it would use some of those core functions in there. If that was the case, the file that you could send out would be a lot smaller. Um, or they're also talking about having a bundle function, which would basically bundle blender with whatever you're exporting or whatever you're sharing so that you would have all of those files so that they wouldn't have to have blender installed on their computer. And so there's a little more information about the technical details on this page, which I'll link to in the notes down below. I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole right here because I'm really kind of looking at the whole idea of this whole thing. All of the code of the Blender apps would be under the same license as Blender. And then the assets and things that are built into that could have whatever license you decide to include with them for that. Okay, so I'd really like to have a discussion about how viable we think that this is. So remember that my perspectives really come from more of the architecture, engineering, and construction background rather than as like a CG artist. For me, there's really like three big questions that would really drive adoption in that space. The first is how easy this would actually be to use. So when we're talking about templates and editing the Python code and that kind of thing, I would need to know a little bit more information about how much code editing you need to be able to do in order to create these, or if you could do kind of a template based thing or if they could have like a viewer template that you could just bundle and then you'd be up and running right because a lot of the people that are using this are people that create designs that want to share them they're not necessarily people that are sophisticated in writing code and other things like that so if there could be any kind of automation of that or built-in templates that could be like a viewer or something like that i think that would definitely affect how much this would be adopted in that space so, I mean, the second question to me is how easy are the files to use? Um, and the reason I say that is because when sharing designs with people, um, you're not necessarily always dealing with people that are necessarily super technologically sophisticated. So that's why the twin motion solution is great because it allows you to share something in a web browser and all they have to do is load it up and it runs for them. So I don't know how complex we're talking about with the zip files and everything else. So that's something that's really gonna be a question for me is how easy are these files to use for people that aren't necessarily super technologically sophisticated, since this does seem to be a tool that's a little bit more designed um, in order to help people share things that they've created with the people that didn't create them. All right, and then my final question is, how are things like rendering handled? 
right? So like, do you lock it into EV or cycles? Do you lock it into material preview mode? How does that work? Because there's usually a lot of things that you have to do to kind of like manage those things um, from figuring out your number of samples, adding denoising, other things like that. So I guess my question is, is this something that's designed to not necessarily work with rendering or is it designed where something is rendered on your screen? I don't really know the answer to that. Maybe I missed it in here, but that's kind of a question I have because if you're sending something to somebody that doesn't even know what rendering is, how do you handle that, right? How do you handle hardware and other things like that? So I'm interested to see how that's handled in this situation as well. Um, I just think it's something that could really affect the experience. Overall, I think it's a really interesting idea. I like the idea of being able to kind of customize Blender so that you can only do certain things. I think there's a lot of value there, but I do have some more questions as to who exactly is it designed for and targeted to and how difficult is it going to be to use. But leave a comment below. Let me know what you think. As always, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this and I'll catch you in the next video. Thanks guys.